Down the mountain the river flows And it brings refreshing wherever it goes Through the valley and over the field The river is rushing and the river is here The river of God sets our feet dancing
<laughs> Sweet Jesus. Oh, you're so great, Lord. Phew. Oh, yes, Lord. Oh, Lord, you're great. And I give you all my praise. Oh, Lord, you're great. I lift my hands and I bless your name. Sing with me. Oh, Lord, you're great. And I give you. And I give you all my praise. Oh, Lord, you're great. I lift my hands and I bless. Take that up. him again. Oh, Lord, you're great. I 
your presence is here. Thankful, Lord, because here you are, here you are. I embrace your presence, oh Lord. too big of a hurry to wait on you, O oh Lord. We wait on you. 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 That's the Lord.
Holy Spirit, we can't let you go. Without telling you, oh Lord, you're the one our hearts long for. You're our soul's desire. your spirit mm. before we go on any further just be quiet a moment Spirit of the Lord, the wind of the Spirit of the Lord is blowing across this place. No messages in tongues, please. Healing wind.
heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? And whom of you will hear the cry of my heart? Where will my resting place be? Here, O oh Lord, have I prepared for you a home. And long have I desired for you to dwell. I prepare a resting place and here oh Lord I wait for you alone and here oh Lord I wait for you alone and here The Lord's here to heal the brokenhearted. He's here to bind up your wounds. He's here to quiet your spirit. He's here to set you free. There's more than one person here tonight who's been caught up in some things that have totally controlled your life. And you've been in church and you've asked the Lord to help you with them, and it seems no help comes. But the Lord's here tonight, and he's letting you know that if you'll surrender completely every area of your life and let go, he'll heal you. He'll heal you, he'll give you freedom. You'll walk without that bondage anymore from this night forward. You'll walk without the chains He'll set you free. Like a bird that's been caged up, he'll set you free. He'll set you free. Do it, Lord. <laughs> Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Shh. Sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus. Oh. fire 
fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand. He's riding a white horse across this land. He's calling out to you and me.
Are you ready? Should the Savior call today? Will Jesus say, well done, I'll go away. He's built a home for the pure. The vow can never stay. Oh, we shall see the King.
You know, for years, I'd have special moments with the Lord, and in those special times, there'd be this deep, deep sense, everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. Doesn't matter what obstacles come, what trials come, what difficulties come, what opposition there is, that deep sense, everything's going to be all right. And you know, sometimes you get weary. You're out laboring, you're working, you're, you're serving, you're giving. You get beaten down, you get hurt. Maybe you make some mistakes along the way. Maybe you know it in the back of your mind and deep down somewhere in your heart you know it. But then you come into the presence of God again. And I'll tell you over and over, in services in this revival and even more outside of the services when I'm home alone, when I'll just be worshiping God at home, when I'll be driving in my car, that deep, overwhelming sense, everything's going to be all right. It's going to be well with the righteous. You can pin your hopes on that. You can pin your future on that. Doesn't matter what you say. Does that mean everything's going to come out just the way I think it should? Friends, that might be the worst thing you could ask for. But if you keep your hope pinned in God and you look at the final end of everything, you'll be rejoicing. You'll be rejoicing, friends. So I want to encourage you, whatever it is that you're in the midst of, don't wimp out, friends. Don't be a baby. Don't lose hope. Don't get in the flesh. You know, I always think to myself, if I'm going through a trying time, if there's real obstacles, opposition, I think well, this is just one little chapter in my life 
Well, I didn't tell anyone to sit yet. You can if you need to, but that's all right. I was just about to. If you can stand, you'll appreciate sitting all the more. I think the Lord might have just been ready to bless one of you. He was saying, let's see if they'll stand one more moment. And that million dollars that you had been praying for was just ready to come. And, but you... I see some people standing again. <laughs> Everybody said, Benny, do you have no needs? <laughs> By the way, if you're visiting here, you want to be critical, that's exactly what we teach. If you stand long enough, God will give you a million dollars. It's one of the cardinal doctrines of the revival. That's what we teach here. But you know, I think to myself sometimes, I think to myself sometimes, let's say I was reading a book about my life later on or somebody was reading it. How would I want this chapter to read? How would I want to be handling myself in the midst of the crisis? What would I, would I want to be with my head hung down and discouraged and hopeless and kind of down in the mouth and not praising God and, and having bad attitudes toward people and then God comes through and you just feel so stupid? Or would you like it that it read in the midst of conflict and difficulty, you went through it with joy, recognizing the trying of your faith produced perseverance? You counted it all joy when you came into all kinds of temptations and difficulties and tests. And at the end of it, when God came through, you were saying, I knew it, Lord. I knew it, Lord. So be encouraged, friends. Be encouraged, set your hope high in God. Persevere, because the scripture is certain it will go well with the righteous. Let's just thank him. Thank him by faith for whatever it is you're in the midst of. Thank him. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. We appreciate you, Lord. You went to the cross, but you rose from the dead. Oh, yes, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. You can be seated safely. Bless you, Lord Jesus. While you're heading back to your seats, I want you to be listening to me. Nobody walking out now. Just get back to your seats. We're, we're glad to have everybody come down from the balcony and press in and join in the worship here. Let's give everybody a few seconds to get back to their seats. We're going to receive an offering in a moment. You're allowed to clap for that. That's all right. Amen. It's actually every few months that I have the privilege of receiving an offering here. And uh, I want to share something with you from the Word. And then while the offering's being received, and then in just a couple minutes beyond that, I want to take that theme a little further in the Word. It was on my heart tonight as we were worshiping and the, the presence of God was just settling in this place in such a real and deep way. How many of you know the Hebrew word for glory? Some of you do. How many would be willing to risk your life on the way you pronounce it? The Hebrew word for glory, many of you know, is the word kavod. And it comes from the Hebrew root, which means to be weighty, to be heavy. The liver is kaved, it's the heaviest organ in the body. And to be weighed down, the word would be keved. In Isaiah 1, the people of Israel, it says, Am keved avon, a people weighed down with iniquity. If I get anything wrong, just stop me, guys. And, all right, thanks. <laughs> and and uh, in that, even in Isaiah 10, it talks about kavod, meaning the, the, the weight, the mass of a physical body. And from the same root come, come the words for honor and treating with respect. So it says in Exodus to 20th chapter in the Ten Commandments, Kabed et avicha ve'et imecha, honor your father and your mother. Kabed, treat them with respect, treat them reverentially, honor them, treat them in a weighty and serious way. And then it says in Proverbs the third chapter, in terms of our giving to the Lord, kabed, again that same word, kabed et Adonai mehonecha, 
honor the Lord from your wealth, from your abundance. Then it goes on to say, and from the first fruits of all your increase and your barns will be filled with plenty and your presses will burst forth with new wine. And I want to encourage you as we receive the offering tonight to give an offering that would honor the Lord, to treat him with respect, to treat him with reverence, to give an offering that would be a worshipful offering to the king. Have you ever had a tremendous joy in you and a tremendous excitement knowing that the blessing of God on your life and it's just your joy to give and it's just your joy to serve? You know, before I was saved, I used to shoot speed as much as I could and you'd have this artificial high where you treat your worst enemy like he was your best friend. Just wanted to do all these great things. That was while the drug was in you. Then when it wore off, you treated your best friend like your worst enemy. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And see, that stuff is just artificial, and in the end, it just messes you up. But it, it's Satan's substitute for real joy and that real sense of assurance and victory and well-being. And I want to encourage you as those who are blessed by God, those to whom God has given so much, his life, his abundance, his grace, I want to encourage you out of the joy and overflow of your own life to worship the Lord, to honor him. As if you were just coming before him, he was standing here to receive the offering. You said, Lord, I want to honor you with this. For someone, it may be honoring the Lord with 50 cents. Someone sent me $10 the other day in cash from the Philippines out of someone's poverty to put into ministry in Israel. That may be a larger offering than any of us have ever given in our lives. And for some others, it could be much more. Whatever it is, I just want you to give. Whatever you give, give it in worship to the Lord. As you know, the expenses ongoing on a regular basis are high here. It was even computed by, uh, by someone working on Steve's staff that we used enough uh, toilet paper in the revival that it would stretch from Pensacola to Washington, D.C. It's going past that now. We've gone past the capital. This revival has touched the capital and beyond. <laughs> By the way, it has touched people in Congress. It has touched people in higher government offices. But even physically, it's, it's reached that far. But you just imagine what the expenses are. So we know you've spent. We're at the Statue of Liberty. Who's going to carry that thing all the way across? That's going to be tough. If you wonder what people do in Steve's office, ministry office every day, they're busy <laughs> computing these things in between dealing with souls and helping those in need. But I want to encourage you, if you're blessed and if you have to give, to give out of the abundance, to give out of the overflow, and give in worship. Whatever you do, give it in worship to the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, help us to honor you with this offering. Lord, to give joyously, to give, Lord, in a way that magnifies you and that treats you with dignity and respect. Lord, not just to give you leftovers, but to give freely out of the abundance of our heart to you in worship and thanksgiving. In the name of Jesus. Ushers, as you come, I just want to remind you, please don't put your tithe in here. If your tithe is the only money you have, don't give that by faith and then have no money for your home church. Give over and above that, but your tithe belongs in the home church and checks are payable to Brownsville Assembly of God. Bless you, folks. We're getting uh, a lot of people ask us different times about new recordings coming, and uh, all I can tell you is we're working on it. We're, uh, we're about to record something new in a few weeks, hopefully. But uh, keep your prayer over us, if you will, in that area, because uh, it's, more, it's much more important that we make music that pleases the ears of the Lord rather than it is just to do a record so, because everybody wants you to do one. We want to please Him, and we want Him to be glorified. I don't think we've quite realized the strength of music and the power that it has to move the human soul towards the Lord in worship. And I think I'm just starting to understand how much music and how powerful it is and how dear it is to the heart of the Lord. It's a strange thing. I was, I was, I was thinking this week and, and just along these lines because you understand when you look up here, you see a, you're, you're seeing a guy act like an idiot. 
and look like he's enjoying himself, and he is. I'm like a kid at Christmas. But there was a time when I really tried to leave music altogether because I wondered if it really was any more than the glorification of the flesh. And I wondered if it had its place in the body of Christ because I didn't feel that it did maybe. I thought maybe our music was just something that we worshiped. But then I began to think just this week, and I'll get all the Bible together and the theology together later so we can have an argument, but uh, I don't want to have an argument. I just want to tell you what's on my heart. Isn't it strange that in church the music has taken the back seat, but in the world it's taken the front seat? Isn't it strange that Lucifer is linked to music and God created him? And God created him as his darling angel, the beautiful one, the one of light. And when he fell, he had enough influence to take several with him. And I'm beginning to realize that when we begin to worship the Lord and play our instruments unto God, that that's something very sacred to the Lord. And when you begin to worship the Lord in your home and in your cars and as you work and you learn the power of praising him, I don't think time, I, that maybe the Lord will give us revelation someday exactly what that is, but there's more to it than what we know because it has the power that the Lord has given it. It's, it's a blessing from the Lord. The music is a gift from God. He created it. Keep in mind, Satan didn't create music. I, I, I'm getting all kinds of articles and I have dear friends who sometimes I think it's a favor, sometimes I think it's a curse. They'll give me things written on the internet and all that sort of thing and stuff about the devil's music and I'm going, what is that? I didn't know he had any. I wasn't aware he created any. I was just aware that he perverted a lot of it. I wasn't aware he owned any. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Hallelujah. Now, I said all that just to get that off my mind, but that's what I've been thinking about this week. How about you? Amen. We have a, we have a, a, a special person with us tonight, and I want him to come and just share up. I'm not going to make a lot of fanfare about it. Uh, Dallas Home has been visiting us quite a bit lately, and you, you all know him. Well, some years ago, there was... Tim had several records out on, his, on a solo career, but he also had done one with Dallas at one time called Home Shepherd Johnson. And I remember a song called Drawing from the Well that I used to worship with quite often. And uh, I wasn't aware that Tim... What's beautiful about this revival is we don't bring people in and parade them across the stage so people will come to the revival. Because when you come, you don't come for that purpose. But what's so funny is when you look over the audience, you see people out there that you recognize, you think you bought one of their records one time, and they're in the floor next to everybody else. And you kind of go, now is that? Oh, it couldn't be. And after church, you'll find out it is. And I just found out last night that Tim Shepard and his wife had visited here four or five times. I've never seen them. I never even knew they were here. And of course, they messed up by letting me know they're here. And uh, because they've got to sing, I would love for Tim to sing and just bless us with a song. Would you make welcome Tim Shepherd tonight? God bless you. I'm forever grateful to the Lord Jesus Christ for his mercy and his grace. Last December, just a few months ago, I was flipping channels late one night, and I saw two testimonies by the Ward sisters, and I began to cry. And I called my wife into the room, and I said, Honey, wherever that is, we're going to go. And so we began our bi-monthly pilgrimages on January 4th in my life, in my music, and the ministry that God has allowed me to have will never be the same. Yeah. 
This is one of the songs that have been birthed from this revival.
Everybody standing, please. I love to meet people and to see what God has placed in them. Everybody, I don't care who they are, that has met God, God has done a work of grace in them, and he's made an investment and a deposit in them, and I love to meet them so I can examine the deposit God's made. And the deposit God's made in Brother Shepherd. I met him last night, prayed with him, met him back there in the lounge a while ago and talked to him, didn't know who he was. Tell him I still don't know who you are. <laughs> but I know one thing, God's blessed you to be a psalmist. He's got his hand on you. I love that. I love that song. Hallelujah. Now, I'll tell you what we're going to do. I want to get about five powerful testimonies tonight. And, um, you know, uh, be quiet just a minute, okay? I want to get about five powerful testimonies, and I want you to um, share them with the people. I want them to be revival-related. And you may be a pastor, you may be an evangelist, you may be a churchgoer, you may be just saved in the last few days. But if you've got something that's really powerful that's happened in your life, something that God has done, uh, really powerful now in regard to the revival, I want you to uh, be prepared in just a moment because I'm going to call on you. And I need about five of you. But right now what I want you to do, I want everybody to take just a few minutes and turn around all around, all around you. And I want you to shake about eight or ten hands and introduce yourself. a testimony, hold your hand up if you have a powerful testimony that you'd like to share. All right, come on up here, son. All right, uh, if you got a real powerful testimony, lady back here. All right, you. Lady back there. I see somebody over here. What about you over there? Right there? You right here. You got a powerful one? All right, come on up here quickly. All right, you got a powerful one? Come on. No, this lady right here. Not, not you right there, baby. This one right here. Right, the back one. <laughs> Y'all going to have to make them quick. <laughs> what? <laughs> Come on. Come on. Yeah. Well, you better go ahead and share yours before you have a spang here. What is it? Oh, last night, the Lord spoke to my heart, and he sent me to talk to Steve Hill, and I never got the chance. And the father said to me, Jamie, you've had a critical heart towards Steve Hill. You need to go, and you need to tell him you're sorry. And he said, and I want you to speak to his mother, because I'm a mother of three daughters. He said, you have wounded her son. <laughs> and then he told me, he said, this is my ministry. It is not Steve Hill's. It is not John Kilpatrick's. It is mine. <laughs> And he told me to tell the people that there is a critical, judgmental spirit among you. And if you, 
do not repent of it, you will not taste of his glory. Bless you. Thank you. All right. Yes, ma'am. Hi. What's your name? I'm Connie, and I'm from Seattle. Seattle? Oh, what's going on up there? Well, actually, we have a church that's just coming up right behind you. We're really excited. God's yeah. moving real strongly. What church do you go to there? It's called Bethel. Um, our what part? In Tacoma, Washington. Mm -hmm. Our pastor is a con um, completed Jew, and we really are getting good teaching and really seeing God move. What's your testimony? Well, there's a whole, I mean, I can't share it all, but the, the one thing I will say that God's really shown me since I've been here is um, that it's really important. You can be seated. Oh. <laughs> I'm not going to be that long. Somebody wants a million dollars out there, I can tell you. <laughs> so many people um, in the process of coming out of where they're coming out have also been touched by the women's movement and by so much of what's the spirit of that generation, that that. I have a right. Come on over here. Talk to us. I like to lean up on this just in case. Oh. <laughs> and what am I leaning on? <laughs> uh, what about the women's movement? Well, I think that it's underneath a lot of what we've talked about, people being delivered from drugs and all kinds of stuff that we've talked about. But what happens is there's, a, there's an underlying spirit in anything that I think that movement touches that has this... I have a right kind of spirit underneath it. I have a right to be, and it even comes into the church, I have a right to be blessed by God because I'm his child, that kind of thing. And what the Lord has just been speaking to my heart over and over again is my rights are laid at his feet. And when I come into his presence, you know, I, I've watched people come with such a heart to be ministered to and such an intensity of wanting to see someone pray for them. And you know what? If I stood in the parking lot and didn't even get a seat, it's God that's going to meet my need. It's not anybody else. <laughs> and what I, what I need to say is how much it's important that we who've come and experienced this revival, we need to say thank you to you, Thank you to the wives, the people who've ministered, the ladies who changed the toilet paper in the bathroom that I just met. We don't have a right to expect that we're going to come here and expect God to move and expect you to be holy and expect and expect unless we've been on our knees to participate with that. And I personally would like to say thank you to you and the people who've worked with you for being willing to walk a walk of holiness to give those people in my generation who were converted in the, in the Jesus People movement, so many of us weren't willing to pay the cost to keep going. And we've lost role models. And you and the women in this congregation, the people on your staff, all of you, have provided that for us. And I will never take that for granted. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. We're running just a little bit late, so I'm going to have to ask you guys to share it quickly. Come here, son. What's your name? And where are you from? My name is Jonathan Cornahan. I'm from Lake Charles, Louisiana. And what's your last name? Carnahan. Carnahan. And, uh, I came to this revival uh, Good Friday, and I left Lake Charles. I got stoned on marijuana. And I was, you were stoned when you left Lake Charles to come here? I was riding with my mom. You uh, was riding with your mother? Yes. And I got here, and I was standing out in the parking lot, and I was, determined, I was trying to figure out whether I was going to go walk down the road and get high again, or I was going to come in here. And, well, I looked up, and I saw my friends walking across the parking lot, and I said, God, if you want me to go in there, let them turn around and look at me. He was about 100 yards away from me. He just turned around and just called my name out. I was like, Phew. I'm going in. <laughs> And so you were here, and you came with your mother, but you wasn't going to necessarily come in when you got here. Right. Uh, so you said, Lord, if you want me to go in there, let my friend turn and look at me. Right, exactly. He called your name. He called my name out. And I went up there, put on my Jesus face, because I grew up in church and all, you know. I just, I was, like, I was saved, you know. You know. What is a Jesus face? <laughs> you know, I have joy on the outside and everything, but inside I'm all bound up. I can't praise God. You know, I'm just deeply hurt. 
But I came in here and I was standing out by the tent and this girl came outside and she started dancing. I was like, she's free. I looked at her and I said, she's free. That's what I want. I want to be free from all my bondages. She said, I'm going inside. And I said, I'm going in with you. I, I, I kind of snuck in because we weren't supposed to, you know. I mean, now you mean to tell me, son, that you came in here? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and I came in and I was standing by the back and counted to three and on two I was right there. Right there. And God just healed me like that. I asked him into my life. I told him, I was like, God, I'm sorry, you know. Every time you sin, you just like rip his beard and drive the nail in and just spit on him every time you do. Every time you cuss, every time you lust, everything. It doesn't matter. That's what you do. And he can just take it all away like that, the lust and all that. And when you do go back in lust, when you do go back, all you got to do is repent right then, that moment. It's a repentant heart. He loves you so much. Just come up here tonight and don't miss it. Don't miss it. I don't care who you are or what you think God won't do or can't do. He can do anything, anytime he wants. So, um, <clears throat> so what you were saying was you put on your Jesus face. That was religion, wasn't it? Exactly. You had a good case of it. Didn't you? Big time for like 15 years. Where's your religion now? <laughs> God bless you, son. <laughs> you know what? Your shirt soaking wet with sweat. I bet you saw that girl dancing, and you asked the Lord to let you dance, didn't you? <laughs> well, your shirt's wet, man. You've been dancing, I can tell. God bless you. You're a fine young man. Bless you. Hey. How you doing? What's your testimony? I was living in Montgomery, Alabama, pastor, and people had told me, you got to go to Brownsville, and I was one of those critical people like the young lady. I said, I don't have to go anywhere for God. I've got God in my heart. And after God dealt with that critical spirit for about six months, I tried to come to Brownsville twice within about a two-month period, but I was restrained by the Holy Spirit. So I waited. The church I was saved at was First Assembly of God at Bell Road in Montgomery. And there was a young man, and I know he won't mind me saying this, Dale Tomlinson, who's here now. He was a Sunday school teacher for my children, and he backslid and fell away from the Lord. But I loved him, and I knew he was sincere, and I knew he loved the Lord, and I would see him every three months, and I'd say, Dale, you ready to come back to the Lord? No, I'm not ready yet. And every time I saw him, he got worse and worse and worse. Kept praying for him. This went on for six years, and I was in and out with my walk with God. But finally, when the Lord told me to come here, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart on a Monday. He spoke again on Tuesday. By Wednesday, I knew it was the Lord telling me to come. And I came Friday night, and I couldn't get in the main sanctuary, so I ended up in the chapel where the big screen was. You know, the Lord loves to take care of every detail of our lives, and he has great, wonderful works that he does. Lo and behold, Dale Tomlinson was being baptized that night. I saw up front, personal, and close a man that I watched go deep into sin, get shooken by the power of holy God. He is radically on fire for the Lord. Don't get around, Dale, because you're going to get saved if you do. He's on fire for Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. I cried for two hours that night. I kept coming every chance that I got. The Lord brought me here to live in October of last year. I got baptized about a month after that. The Lord has restored my first love. I thought I was right with God. I wasn't right with God. I was deceived. The deceitfulness of sin will keep you blind to the truth of God's holy word and what he requires in our life. And I just praise God for his grace in this place that brought me back. There's many other testimonies. He's married me to a beautiful godly woman from Taiwan. My car broke down, Pastor. It was a night that you said, if you give $100, God has a threefold blessing. Two days later, 
They took up the offering. They were taking it to the back, but the Holy Spirit said, go give that $100, son. I'm trying to bless you. I got up out of the pew, ran back, said, wait. I put my $100 in the blessing. Two days later, my car broke down, completely gone, the engine, the motor. I said, oh, this is great, Lord. My father owns new dance clubs in Atlanta, Georgia. I've been praying. He owns what now? He owns nude dance clubs and lingerie shops in Atlanta, Georgia. He's a multi, multi millionaire. And he's been trying to get me to come and work for him because I'm his oldest and only son other than a 10 year old son that he has now. And I've been praying for his soul and believing God that my whole household will be saved in the name of Jesus. We have not had any communication because one time I went to him for money about six years ago against what the Spirit was telling me when I was in need financially. And a good Christian person said, he's your dad, you know, you can go to him. Well, he mocked Jesus when I asked him because I didn't have much and I was going through the wilderness. And he says, oh, you got Jesus, but you got to come to me, Mr. Wicked Man, who needs to repent of his sin because I done told him he needed to repent and get right with God. But you're going to come to me for money. So I vowed that day I would never ask him for another dime. But I just want to share one more quick miracle what God's doing. Six years, I talk to him, but I don't ask him for nothing. The Lord told me to call him for the money that I needed for a car. I was working with a guy. The woman is a Christian. She offered me the car. It's about a $2,500 car. She let me have it for $1,000. That was the first blessing. You said threefold. The second blessing I struggled with walking on the beach. God said, call your dad. I want you to call him and tell him you need the money. Man, I was shaking while I was asking him for the money. I said, Dad, I'm down here. I'm trying to go to the Bible school, this and that. And we've been in touch. And I said, I need $1,000. The Lord's really blessed me with a car that's worth about $2,500, but I need to borrow 1000 I swear I'll pay you $100 every month. He said, how much you say you need? $1,000. Oh, I'll send it to you. You don't have to pay me a dime back. That was the second blessing. And then the third blessing was God blessed me with a wonderful godly wife. I praise God for what he's doing here. And I thank God for such a pastor and a man of God's heart who was willing to do what you did, brother, and just see the glory of God come in this place. Thank God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hi. What's your name? Robert McLendon. What's your name? Robert McLendon. What's your testimony? Um, I, I fell off my front steps and fractured my knee twice. And I came here Sunday, and the, the doctor told me uh, that Friday that I might have to have surgery on my knee. And he said I might never be able to do any football or anything like that. And he, um, I came here Sunday, and he told me, um, Brother Steve Hill grabbed the crutches from me and blessed me. I was laying on the ground, and, and I said, I can move my leg. And I was like, wow. When I got up, my mom said, just wait until you go to the doctor Monday. And the doctor said, there's nothing wrong with my knee. Wow. Hi, right, what's your name? Uh, my name's Joe Oden, and I'm on fire for Jesus. And how do you know? Because I can feel it. <laughs> I just, I just want to say, you know, when I was little, I, I lived in sin. And I kept on living in sin, and God just kept on popping me. He said, no, boy, don't do that. And I'd get in trouble with the law, and I'd stay in trouble. And God kept on popping me, you know. And then I'd run across this judge, and he's... And he made me go to church. <laughs> Where are you from? I'm, I'm from Mobile, Alabama. So this judge <clears throat> told you you had to go to church? Yes, sir. He told me he, he'd put me in jail if I didn't go to church. Did it work? Yeah, it worked. <laughs> I went to, went to church, and, and, and I was still fighting it, you know, and 
and God popped me again. <laughs> and, I, and I went to drugs. What do you mean when God pops you? He, don't be never mind, go ahead. He, he, he puts me in jail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We understand. Okay, and, uh, and I went to drug rehab, and when I got out, you know, I always knew when I got off drugs, I could serve the Lord. I couldn't do it on drugs. You know, you can't do it when you're sinning. And I knew that, even as a sinner. And, 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 and when I got out, you know, of rehab, I gave my life to the Lord, you know, and I just kept on seeking God with all of my heart. And, and he's just blessed me, you know. And I was standing over there one night over there in this revival, and God told me that there's people lost to go and save them. And, you know, I just kept on seeking the Lord, and he's going to open doors for me. And he already is. And if you just seek the Lord with all your heart, he'll open up every door you ever wanted. <sighs> So now I'm going to go back and tell the judge I'm on fire for God. Hi. How you doing, son? Where are you from? Nahana, Georgia. Anna Georgia, what's your name? Hannah. Nahana, Georgia. Nahana. Matthew Crew. What's your name? Matthew Crew. Matthew. What's your testimony, son? Well, I went to church and God saved me, you know, he saved my soul and I you know it's backslid and all and when I was riding home, I, I was a sinner and I was riding down the dirt road, you know, riding down the road at night time. And this truck was coming to me, I said, Lord, don't let me get hit. I done got hit one time, you know. And he goes, well, man, if you don't move out of the way right now, you're going to get hit. By the time I moved out of the way, the, the van, the uh, Jeep pulled over and it go hit me. And if it wasn't for God, I'd have got hit that night. And uh, I got saved and backslid again, you know. But the best thing about it, all I had to do was reach my hand up. He had been right there for me. I didn't do it. Uh, I kept on and kept on, you know, backsliding, backsliding. And, you know, the preacher told me, Matt, you need to take heed to the Lord. You're in the hands of an angry God right now. And right back there, I got saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> My God. Are you sure? You know, so let me tell you something. Some of you may look at something like that and you might say, ah, I don't know. But you know when a kid comes in like that and he says that the Lord spoke to him, moved just in the nick of time and he moved. And then a preacher says to him, son, you're in the hands of an angry God right now. You better get right. If God hadn't got a hold of this young man, he may be in hell. He, he could be dead and in hell. You know, you got to understand something. There's more people under the earth in the soil, in their graves, and there are on top of the earth. And he could have joined more people in the heart of the earth or in the soil of the earth than there are on top of the earth. He could have been dead and in hell. So what God did for him, you know, saved him back there. That's a miracle. Anytime God saves anybody, it's better than blind eyes being open or deaf ears being unstopped. Thank God. Hi. What's your name? Robin McNeil. Robin McNeil. Where are you from? Covenant Community Church in Fort Walton. What's your testimony? I was um, healed and filled with the Holy Spirit in the second row of the balcony. I came in. I had been sick for a month. The doctors had done blood work. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. Uh, the week that I came in, I had had 
been to the doctor every day that week. And I went in that, thir that Friday, and the doctor sent, sent me home. He told my husband, he said, she's too sick for us to even do the tests on her today. Just take her home. And I told my husband, we were coming to Brownsville. We've been coming to Brownsville since the first year. And we came in that night. This was in November. And I told my husband, I said, if I can just get to Brownsville, I know the Lord will heal me. I, t I just knew it. And we came in, and we went up there. And just as soon as Brother Lendl Cooley started into praise and worship, I just started crying. I didn't know why. It was just uncontrollable. And he stopped, and all of a sudden he just broke into, I surrender all. And when he did, I dropped to my knees, and I threw my hands in the air, and I said, Lord, I surrender all. I have been trying to do this on my own, and I can't. And I give it to you. And when he did, the next thing I knew, I was raised Baptist, and the next thing I knew, these sounds started coming from my mouth that I had no idea what were. <laughs> and at that point, he began to shake me, something else I had never experienced, and he shook me, and I spoke in tongues for three solid hours. <laughs> and when we walked out of here, I was healed. I walked into the doctor's office that Monday, and they could not believe the difference. And... I just thank God, and it just started there. Nobody touched you, did they? No one touched me. That's, that's why what Brother Cooley was saying about how powerful praise and worship is. It is. No one touched me except for the Holy Spirit during praise and worship. You know, the wonderful thing, most of the healings that take place in this, in this church can't be attributed to anybody laying hands on them. See, God gets the glory, and it happens during praise and worship. And God just heals people during praise and worship. And I, I like it like that. Amen. Let no man get the glory. Let all the glory go to God. God bless you, sweetheart. Hi, right, come here, son. Hey, man, what's your name? Uh, my name's Sam Solis. Samson? Sam. Oh, Sam. Where are you from? Uh, Pueblo, Colorado. Pueblo, Colorado. Come up here. <laughs> what's your testimony? Uh, this is my second time back here. And... Um, if there's anything I received from when we came back in November, it was a, a passion for prayer. Um, that was one of the biggest convictions in my life was that, that I need to be a man of prayer. And, and we came with some of our church members, and, and it's something we realized. So we went back to our church and started having 5 a.m. prayer meetings. And, uh, and I got together with my grandmother. And I have 12 brothers and sisters, that's including in-laws and and they were as lost as lost can be. And, um, and we started praying and, and taking it before God for our family to be saved. And um, within a month, they haven't been in church ever, and within a month, 11 of them are serving God. And, um, and it's funny because... Oh, wait a minute. You had 12 that you were praying for, and 11 made it. They, they, within a month, they were saved in church, serving God. Yes, one of them's that close right now. He's a brother-in-law. And uh, in church right now, they're, they're still going. They're going strong. It's a good kind of save. They take up two rows in church, and, and it's, it's just it's, it's encouraging. Well, that's great, son. God bless you, man. Uh, <clears throat> tell us your name and where you're from. Uh, my name is Jeff, and I live here in Pensacola. I, I moved here in, in January. Where'd you come from? Uh, I came from Texarkana, and uh, I'm a student of school of ministry. And uh, ever since I came down and moved down here to go to school, I've been really um, believing God to, for this revival to go out to the streets and to see the power of God fall, like in the mall and and uh, restaurants. And I, I've seen, um, I saw that happen yesterday. Um, me and uh, my roommate, uh, one of my roommates, Mike Lobanovic, we clean carpets, and um, we had to drive to Navarre. And if we don't get paid for the job, then we don't get any money. So we got out there, and the lady didn't, didn't want us to do the job. And we started ministering to her, and she was divorced, and she was going through some problems, and we talked to her. She got real excited about the revival, and she wants to come next week. And, and uh, we said, can we pray for you? She said, yeah. And uh, she was Catholic. She uh, I don't think she knows the Lord, and uh, we, we held her hands, and we started to pray for her, and as we did, the power of God fell in that room, and this lady, she was sitting like this before we started praying. When we opened our eyes, she was like this, and 
I mean, she had to felt it because the power of God was all over us. And, uh, man, the glory of God was all over us all that day. And uh, about a month ago, um, I was in Popeye's Chicken, and I was working on my research paper for school. And... Um, <laughs> And um, <laughs> I missed the link there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hard to study with. I got three roommates, and, yeah. and at the time I had two extra friends staying with me. So, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I, would, I had just gotten, um, I had just pulled out of here. I was working with the youth discipleship, and I was going to go. And I didn't. I don't ever like to miss service, but I was going to have to miss that night to get caught up. And uh, as I pulled out of the parking lot, um, there was a guy across the street, and I said, hey, how you doing? And he said, oh, don't preach to me. And I said, sir, I'm not preaching to you. And he said, if you don't get out of here, I'm going to jump this fence, and I'm going to bust you in the head with a rock. And I said, sir, I'm ready to die for Jesus. You think I'm afraid of you hitting me with a rock? <laughs> <coughs> So I was, I was kind of excited whenever I got to Popeye's, I was, you know. <laughs> and so I was, I was preaching to the, the everybody. Now, somebody couldn't hear a good may have thought you said that he jumped the fence and popped you in the eye. That's not what you said. No, no, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't do anything violent to me. He just, he, he cursed me out and, and I drove off. And, but he threatened me, and, and, but I was excited about that because, you know, I, I felt, well, little bit of persecution, that's nothing big. <laughs> so what happened? Well, I went to Popeye's Chicken, and I'm preaching to everybody in there, the, guy, the people behind the counter, and they love it, though. They're not, they're not cussing me out. They're like, they want to know more. They want me to come back. And I'm, I'm sitting down, and I'm working on my paper, and I see this kid sitting down, one of the kids that worked there, he's sitting down. And, and I notice his, well, I come over there and when I, I witness to him and he says he loves Jesus and he's serving him and, you know, I had to take his word for it and he had like flour on his arm. I said, what's wrong? He said, I burnt my hand in the grease. I said, do you mind if I pray for you? He said, yeah, sure. You know, I said, I'm going to lay my hands on you. Is that okay? He said, yeah, yeah, go right ahead. So I prayed for him, got real loud and prayed for him. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so I left, you know, I, I, and he left and I, and I go back to work and I'm, you know, I think you ask God to heal somebody, God heals them, period. So I don't even, you know, he's gone. I come back about, uh, about eight days later, come back because I wanted to go back in there. I, I told those people I'd come back and, and preach to them some more. <laughs> <clears throat> and so um, I went in there. And he said, I started talking to him and said, I told you I'd be back. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, where's your friend or whatever you're in, or that you were going to bring with you? I said, well, he's not here. And uh, this other lady that I'd never seen before, she said, are you the one that prayed for John or whatever his name was? I said, yeah. Oh, well, you, God healed him and all this. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I mean... I mean, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised, but, but the, the report, well, I didn't get to talk, I would like to talk to the kid, I guess I need to go over and talk to him, and he said that he came to work the next day talking about how <clears throat> the pain started going away a few minutes later, that it did not hurt at all the next day, and there were no scars, and I was... I got me and a couple of other students from the school on Saturday nights. Of course, we don't like to miss the service, but we'll come and praise and worship, and then we'll go down to Palafox Street where there's several bars. And we stand right out in front of the, the bars, and we preach, and then we, we witness to people, and um, they don't like it. The bartenders, those bar owners, they do not like us. They do everything they can, and they tell us, they say, they tell, we're going to go get the police, and they, they go get the police, and the police say, well, you know, you have to go by these certain guidelines, otherwise we can't do anything to you. And so we, we follow what they, the police tell us to do. And we're out there, and we're not, I wasn't even preaching. I was talking, just witnessing. One-on-one, -on -one. I wasn't making any kind of disturbance. I, actually, I wasn't in front of his door. I was a good distance away, and he said, 
you can't stand in front of my door. And I said, I'm not, I'm not in front of your door. And then this lady that was with me, uh, she goes, sir, do you know Jesus? And he got real mad. And he said, I'm going to, y'all better get out of here now. And I, and I looked at him, Holy Spirit, he, he, he showed me that door. And I said, no, sir, that's not the point. The point is not where we stand. The point is you and your heart. And where do you stand before the Lord? And where are you going to go when you die? And this brother, he got in my face, touching his nose on top of my nose, and started cussing me out. And uh, I know this had to have been God. Because as he stepped back, I just said, God bless you, sir. Jesus loves you. And then that made him even matter. He said, I'm going to get the police. <laughs> <laughs> but um, y'all... Y'all pray for me and, and, and our brothers at the school because um, we're, we're not going to stop. We're going to start going back. <laughs> hey, Angel. How are you? Tell everybody your name. I'm Angel Clark. I'm from Pensacola. I don't know who he is. Okay. Right. okay. I thought this was your brother or something. No. Angel Clark. Mm -hmm. Well, what's going on? Well, um, before I come to the revival, I was a drug addict, suicidal, alcoholic. I mean, involved in gangs. I mean, I was out there. <laughs> and How old are you? I'm 14. You were in a gang. I was in a gang. Sure enough, was. In Pensacola. Yep. And so you were just out there, really on the streets, before revival broke out. When did you start coming to revival? May 2nd was the first time I come, and I thought. Of this year. Yeah. I thought I was just going to come and, okay, I'm going to go to sleep and, you know, leave after it's over. How did you wind up coming? Did somebody invite you? My aunt and uncle did. Mm. Are they Christians? Yes, they are. They're sitting right up there. Where are they at? <laughs> so, this is your mother's sister or your daddy's sister? Daddy's brother? They're not really my aunt and uncle. They're just real close friends of the family. Just call them aunt and uncle. Yeah. Well, they brought me, and I thought I was just going to come and go to sleep. And I seen somebody getting baptized. They had enough influence on you to really make you want to come with them? Yeah. And I, I seen somebody get baptized that night that I knew, and it put me in conviction bad. Yeah. And I ended up getting saved, and my uncle gave me a card. And he told me whenever I was ready to get baptized, just call the number on the card. Well, I ended up calling Monday got saved or baptized the next Friday yeah. and ever since then I was just I was clean from drugs till about three weeks ago and I backslid and I quit coming to church and went started going back to my old ways well I ran into somebody from the church and they put me in conviction in the middle of a parking lot yeah. in the middle of a parking lot they put me in conviction they put you under conviction in the middle of a parking lot so you just got discouraged and sort of went back in the world Went back, come back last Saturday and talked to Steve Hill and everything, come up here and ask forgiveness. And ever since I've asked forgiveness, I've been able to turn down all the drugs all over again and everything. <laughs> what would you say? What would you say to somebody out there that has made a mistake, they've sinned, they've gone back into the world, what would you say to them? Well, if y'all ain't in church, y'all need to be here, backsliding or not, this is the place to be. If you're here, at least you're not out on the streets doing those things you want to do. I mean, this is Saturday night, I know plenty of my friends that's probably out there getting high, getting drunk right now. I mean, and I've had a couple of them come to church, but, I mean, if you were here, you wouldn't be out doing that. If you're backsliding, get up here and ask for forgiveness. And if you're not saved, you need to get up here and ask forgiveness because all of us that are saved know where we're going. Where are you going? Amen. 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 Now you said, you said while you was out there in the world that somebody put you under conviction. How'd they do that? They just started talking to me. They were like, where have you been? We miss you. God loves you. Did you were around your friends in the world? Yeah. I was talking to you? Yeah, I was around a bunch How of my did you feel? It was strange. I mean, I've never actually had that happen to me. It's just, I was like right there. and I'm Embarrass you? No, not really. I'm just somebody, angel don't cry. Crying's for punks. I've always looked at it that way. I got a lot of pride. That night, I didn't have no pride. I mean, I was in tears before it was over with.
Hey, Pard. How you doing, man? Good. How old are you? Eight. Turn around here and let everybody see you. You're eight years old. Let me see that smile. Boy, that's a good looking smile. What's your name? Jake Bigby. I'm from California, Antioch, California. Jay? Your name is Jay? Jake. Jake. Jake Bigby. Okay, and you're from California. What's your testimony? Well, one night I was getting in bed and I was laying down and the Lord told me, Jake, one day you're going to lead my people. You're, you ever heard of T.D. Jakes? What? You ever heard of T.D. Jakes? The preacher, the black preacher T.D. Jakes? No. You might be the white T.D. Jakes. <laughs> well, you was, so you was, you was eight years old. You laid down at night, kind of getting a little bit bad. You said you was getting to be bad again? Or are you just going to bed? What would you say? I was going to bed. Oh, he's going to bed. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so he was going to bed, and the Lord spoke to you. You heard the Lord speak to you? Uh-huh. And he said? You're going to lead my people someday. How would you feel? Good. Great. Great. Did he say anything else? No. <laughs> well, you know what? The one thing about it is, God is not a liar. The Bible says, the Bible says that God cannot lie. So if he told you that you was going to lead his people, I want to make a recommendation to you. Okay? I want you to remember this. Stay close to Jesus. Keep a prayer life. Pray. Talk to the Lord. And the other thing is, stay away from other boys and girls that has a bad influence on you. Stay away from them. Because they'll lead you away from God. And I pray over you that God will make you strong in the power of his might. And that the glory of the Lord settle on you, Jake. And that God raise you up, son. And use you in the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. upon you because he has anointed you to preach good news the spirit of the sovereign God is upon you because he has anointed you to preach good
is upon us because he has anointed us. stand and we're going to pray a prayer. We're going to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts, change our lives. In a few minutes, Charity's going to sing, run to the mercy seat. Mercy is undeserved forgiveness. Son, let me tell you something. When the, the judge said go to church, that was mercy. That was mercy. I've shared the story of a man who was in Napoleon's military and it was constantly deserting the army in the face of battle. He would run, he would jump into a foxhole, he'd run into the woods, he couldn't stand the enemy's fire. And Napoleon saw that one day. Sent his military out to find him in the woods and, and he was brought in and put on trial for treason and desertion. He was guilty. And in Napoleon's army at that time, the penalty for desertion was death by hanging, automatic. There was enough witnesses standing against him, plus the general himself had seen the man desert the army. And so it was more, like, more or less a kangaroo court when Napoleon came in, they brought the man before him. He fell on his face before Napoleon and Napoleon called out his name and said, you are guilty of desertion. And the penalty is death. About that time, a woman came running into the courtroom, screaming at the top of her lungs, Napoleon, Napoleon, have mercy on my son. And he said, ma'am, your son is guilty of desertion. And the penalty is death. He deserves to die. And she said this, I know he is guilty of desertion. And it's true, he deserves to die. That's why I'm pleading for mercy. And Napoleon couldn't handle that. A mama.
pleading for mercy. And he said, woman, take your boy home. He's a free man. Friend, if it wasn't for the mercy of the cross, from the cross, Jesus looked out at every single one of us in this place, whether you're a drug addict, an alcoholic, or a stuck-up Christian, whoever you might be in this place, the Lord looked out at you and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's mercy. I want everyone to pray with me right now. If you're a God-hater, I want you to pray. If you're a God-lover, I want you to pray. Everyone pray out loud. Dear Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. In your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Boy, what a service. How many love those testimonies? You know. You can come in this place and you can hate the shaking. You can criticize it all you want. Whatever, you know, it's up to you. But just remember, every one of us will stand before the Lord alone, okay? If you hate shaking and you're here with some of your friends that hate shaking and you just hate, you hate any of that emotional stuff, just remember, there's going to be a day of judgment and you will stand before God alone. Your friends won't be with you. To, to back you up and say, yeah, we hate shaking too. You will be alone before God. I want everyone to remember this. Every word that comes out of my mouth will be judged. Every idle word. And it won't matter if my wife is here or John Kilpatrick or anybody else. I will be alone one day before God Almighty. For my attitudes, I'll be judged. For my idle words, I'll be judged. For my actions, I'll be judged. And it's easy to, to cop an attitude and to have, a, have an opinion about something here on earth because we always gather ourselves around others that have the same type of opinion. But just remember, friend, when they're all gone, you're naked and alone before God Almighty. Make sure the judgments you have are correct because you'll stand before God for them. And you can watch a young person fall to the ground and shake and go, that's an abomination. Look at that. The kid looks like he's on drugs. No, friend, he was on drugs. But I can tell there's some people in this place that are struggling with this. I'm trying to help you out. I honestly want to help you out. Because it's not about shaking. You can shake and fall all day long. I want to see a changed life. But don't discount the power of God. If you discount the power of God, you might as well erase most of the New Testament. Because the man that wrote most of the New Testament, his name was Saul of Tarsus. And that man had a violent encounter with God. There's a lot of people that had a sweet encounter, like Lydia, the seller of purple. She had a wonderful, sweet, she, just a believism. She just sort of believed and followed Jesus. Nothing powerful took place when you read her story. But Saul of Tarsus was different. He was one of those people you walk up to him with a track. Remember, he was a killer of Christians. You walked up to him on the track and say, Saul, 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 Jesus loves you and has a plan for your life. <laughs> Off with your head, Bubba. He wouldn't give you the time of day. He'd give you a, a noose. He'd lock you up in prison. He'd beat you. So how did God have to deal with Saul of Tarsus? Same way he's dealing with a lot of us in this room. He's getting our attention. And one day on the way to Damascus, you read it in Acts chapter 9, it's recorded several times in the Word. Paul loved his testimony. See, you can't argue with a testimony. It's a personal thing. And Saul was on his way to Damascus. And for those of you that don't like what God's doing in this place, you'd have a hard time with Saul of Tarsus. Because the man that wrote most of the New Testament was struck at midday, a bright light shone in the heavens, came down to earth, Brighter than the sun at midnight. It was bright today, wasn't it? Could you imagine out there in that line a brighter light than the sun today? That's what Saul saw. And he fell to the ground, the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say he stood up and went, wow, can you believe that, guys? Look at that light. He fell to the ground. I don't know if he was thrown to the ground. I don't know if he stumbled over. All I know is he bit the dust. And in the, on the ground, he began speaking to a voice. This is getting weird, friends. 
He began speaking to a voice. The voice spoke to him and he spoke back. And not only that, friend, something happened there that's odd. He was blinded. Not only blinded for a few seconds because of the brightness, like when you'd look up at the sun for too long, your eyes would be blinded for a few minutes and you'd see spots and dots. No, three days he was blinded. On the third day, a man prayed for him. Is this in the Word, scholars? It's in there somewhere. People that aren't scholars are going, yeah. Twelve-year-old kid out there went, yeah, it's in there. Call on me anytime, Brother Steve. I'm here. <laughs> but a man prayed for him, and something like scales fell from his eyes. It's in the Word, friend. I'm talking about fish scales. Something like scales fell from his eyes. And I don't know the rest of the story. I know that Paul shared that a bunch of times. But maybe he scooped them up and put them in his pocket. The Bible doesn't say what happened to the scales. Maybe the maid cleaned them up. Maybe the dog ate them. I don't know. But maybe, just maybe, Paul had them in his hand and he put them in his pocket because that's cool. Would that be cool? That would be cool. You know, they fell from your eyes. You put them in your pocket so you can share your testimony. Maybe Saul walked around once he became Paul. He became a convert in about five seconds, by the way. He was changed. The power of God will change you. I've had people come in this revival, God haters, and they'll come up to this altar and stand here like this. Just snots, you know? And I've watched God slam snots, just wham! Wham! And that snot will be down on the ground, getting all of this Jesus all over him. Next thing you know, they're going, what must I do, man? What must I do to get saved? I mean, we have this happen all the time. But you might be one friend in this place. You didn't like what happened to Saul of Tarsus. He was sharing his testimony one day, and you heard that stuff, and you're going, I can't believe that for a second. God would never have somebody fall to the ground like that and get all dirty. <laughs> Why? Because that's not how it happens in your church. God would never do anything like that. God would never blind a man. Scales, my word, Saul. Blinded, scales fell from your eyes. Give me, some of you would do that to him. You would do that to him. Little did you know that you were talking to the writer of most of the New Testament, but you didn't like his testimony because it was violent. Yours was more quiet and subdued, but his was violent, and you didn't like that. Friend, I want to tell you, back off. Back off. Let God be God. Let him do whatever he wants. Glory. Well, many of you know that October 28, 1975, for those of you that have come to the revival before, I had a dramatic experience with the Lord. My life was supernaturally transformed by the power of God during an encounter with him. You can have an encounter with God. I had an encounter at 11 o'clock a.m. My mother is here tonight. Wave at me, Mama. Where are you at? My mom is here. She was there when this encounter took place. She could share with you the story of what took place. She had been nursing me for like three days. My body was going through violent convulsions. But it wasn't, it wasn't withdrawals from drugs because I had not done any narcotics for months, or at least weeks. I had not, and so I knew, I knew what withdrawals were. I was a mainliner, a, a, a druggie. I used to pump narcotics in my veins all the time. And, but I hadn't done any narcotics for several weeks. So I, if I had been doing narcotics, I, this, this would have been withdrawals. But this wasn't withdrawals. It was something else. My body was violently convulsing for three days. And my mom, she's here tonight. This is a testimony that's true. She would come into my room and wipe my forehead down. And, and, I, would, and I would say, Mama, Mama, I'm burning up. She'd wipe me down. And then say, I'd say, Mama, I'm freezing. Then she'd pour, put a blanket over me. And I'd say, Mama, I'm burning up. Back and forth, hot and cold sweats. On the third day, a man came into my room. Mom called this man. His, man. his name was Hugh Mazingo. He was a Lutheran vicar. He came over to my house trembling. He walked into my room, looked into my face and grabbed my hand. I was a drug addict for 12 years. 13 times busted for sales of narcotics, car theft, drugs, and you name it, friend. 
Wandering the states, just back and forth. Always, I was one of those bum hitchhikers on the side of the road. Always looking for happiness. In and out of rock and roll bands. Just having the time of my life, but wasted. Wasted. And here I was. I was at the brink of death. I knew I was. He grabbed my hand and he said, Steve, I can't save you. And I can't help you. But I know somebody who can. He said, his name is Jesus. And he's in this room. And I looked up at him, I said, I don't believe in God. And he said, that's okay, he's here anyhow. <laughs> I love that, man. Some of you in this room, if somebody said that, you go, well, let me, uh, let, me, let me talk to you about this then. No, friend, God exists whether you believe it or not. And he said, pray with me, and I said, I don't know how to pray. And he said, that's okay, just say the name Jesus. And I remember, I'm talking about an encounter. Not an encounter with a Lutheran minister. Not an encounter with an Assembly of God church. Not an encounter with a group of deacons. Not an encounter with an evangelist. Not an encounter with a Billy Graham crusade. I'm talking about an encounter with a living God. And that's what all those other ones are about. Getting you to have an encounter with a living God. The Brownsville Revival is about an encounter with a living God. It's not about the music. It's not about the preaching. It's not about the testimonies. All those lead you to an encounter with a living God. It's like someone once said, you know, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You're wrong, friend. You can make him drink. You can salt his oats. You put some salt in his oats, that horse is going to come to that pond. He'll come to that bucket of water. And people come in here sometimes just hard and cold. They don't want nothing from God. They're here just to find out what this crazy thing's all about. But about two hours into it, they're going. Man, they got something. I ain't God. And that's what was happening in my room. And I began to say the name Jesus. I said, Jesus, 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 not knowing what was about to happen, friend. I began saying that name. I want to let you know here, friend, I'm testifying to you. There is power in the name of Jesus. I began saying that name, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And the more I said his name, the more power came into my body. I felt it. I felt it. Now, you're talking about a young man who knew nothing about religion. I didn't know anything about any of this, friend, but I felt it. I didn't know any scriptures. I didn't know what to call it. I didn't, I didn't know how to say, I didn't look up at him and go, dear God, vicar, the presence of the most high one. He is touching my mortal body. I didn't know anything, friend. All I know is that in a matter of seconds, years of addictions were going out. Years of pain, years of misery, years of suffering was going out of my body. Shoot. Mm. It's as if it happened yesterday. My conversion was genuine. I got, one, I, was, I got really saved, okay? Really changed. You ever met people like that? In your face type of saved. You know, don't preach to me type of saved. Get out of my face type of saved. I got saved. But you know what's interesting? When I was a drug addict, I was a wild wheeling and dealing drug addict. I'd put, I'd put quaaludes, I'd put morphine, I'd put heroin right in your face. I'd walk up to you and I'd pester the daylights out of you. I'd say, how come you're not getting high with me, man? How, and I'd, I'd push the drugs right on you. I'd try to get people to get... I'd, I'd, like, I'd push the needle in their arm, anything, to get somebody high. That's how the devil is. Have you ever noticed you're at a party, you know, and you got saved and you're, you're hanging out? Maybe it's a wedding or something like that, and some un unsaved people there, and they're all drinking and partying. They want you to drink with them. And you go, no, I'll just take a Coke. No, have a drink. I'll take a Coke. No, have a drink. I said, I'll take a Coke. I'm fine, thank you. You're no fun. I'm having a blast. What's your problem? You ever notice how the world is so pushy? It's in your face, everything in your face. Well, Christianity needs to be the same way. It needs to be in your face. Don't push your religion on me, boy. I want to tell you, you will wish somebody had. You will wish somebody had on that final day, friend. You'll be screaming for a preacher. You'd give anything for another gospel track. 
You'll give anything for one tape from, a, from Brownsville or one, one witness from that little girl, Angel. Anything to hear the gospel one more time. Well, I did not cry out that day in the name of Brownsville Assembly. I did not cry out that day, I'll go one step forward. I was not lying on my bed and I did not look up into the heavens and say, in the name of the assemblies of God. Thank God. <laughs> and I'm telling you tonight, friend, you can look at the devil, you can put a sneer, snotty expression on your face or a Jesus face. Didn't you love that? <laughs> Kid, I don't know where you're at, but that was so classic. Oh, going to church. Let me see. <laughs> that Jesus face, you know? And when the preaching's going on, you hold your head at that consecrated angle. <laughs> Boy, we've learned. We have learned how to be religious. All the outward appearance, but no power. You can look at the devil, put a snotty expression on your face, grab your list of denominations. This is my list of denominations, by the way. These are all the denominations in the United States of America, and I apologize, this list is five years old. It's probably twice this long by now. But you can take this to the devil, and you can say, read it and weep, devil. He's laughing. That's nothing, friend. This is fine print. If it was the size that I, it really was, it'd reach all the way to that door. He would laugh in your face. This means nothing to Lucifer. In the name of the Pentecostal Union. In the name of the United Methodist. In the name of the Presbyterian Church of America. In the name of the Assemblies of God. In the name of the Church of God. In the name of the Episcopalians. The devil's never heard any of it, friend. He laughs all the way. But something happens. Something happens, friends. Something begins to rumble in the corridors of hell when you mention another name. The walls, the walls in hell begin to quake and the demons begin to shake when you say that name. It's not a long name like Orville Rettenbacher or John D. Rockefeller. It's an easy name. I think we need to practice it. It's an easy name. And for those of you that are here, I know there's some folks here that are probably into witchcraft. Every night, folks come that are into witchcraft and warlock and, and, and sorcery and all kinds of black magic. And we welcome you. And I want to challenge you something, son. Ma'am, I want to challenge you. If you don't think there's power in the name Jesus, next time you get in your seance... I'm just going to give you a, I'm going to give you a little test here, friend. Just get in that seance, get the candles burning, lights down low, get the who going. <laughs> and you can sit there and go, ho, oh. you can go, Harley Davidson. Oh, oh, oh. You can say, Florida State Seminole. Alabama Crimson Tide. Chicago Bulls. It doesn't go happen, friend. Try this. Just go, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, heaven comes down. Oh, heaven comes down. Woo! Try that. Lamb, glory. Well, if you would do that, it would cause no small stir. The candles will flicker. People will get upset. That's the only name that shakes the underworld.
Well, I want to explain something to you tonight. This is not going to take long. Thank you, sister. <laughs> Some of you still haven't figured it all out, how, what, what, why you are the way you are. I'm going to give you a, a, just a, a, a brief, just a synopsis of how you get yourself in such a pickle. Okay, how you, some of you are so messed up here tonight. And others of you are backslid, but some of you are just, you never, you can't backslide. You got to front slide before you can backslide, okay? <laughs> some of you have never front slid. You've never slid into home plate. You've never come to Jesus. And so you can't backslide if you've never known the Lord. But I just want to share with you a few points tonight, friend. And I got to give this a title. So I'm going to say, um, I'm not going to give you a title. This, you can call it Saturday night's message. But I want you to understand, first of all, friend, this is how we get ourselves in this predicament. We are all born into bondage. I want you to understand this, because psychology will tell you just the opposite. They will tell you you are born an angel, and the world makes you rotten. I want to tell you, friend, the Bible says, Psalm 51.5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. You were born rotten. Everybody say, I was born rotten. I was born rotten. You were born a slime. You don't have to say that. But everybody was born a slime. You ever watched a baby being born? They're slimy. <laughs> you know? We were all born slimes, but we are all born in sin. Have you ever noticed, friend, none of us had to learn how to be bad? Angel, where are you at? Angel, you never had to take bad lessons, did you? It just sort of came natural to be bad. It's easy to be bad. Have you ever noticed a, a worker uh, trying to control a nursery? Why do you have to control a nursery? Why do you have to have workers in a nursery? They're just little toddlers. Aren't they just going to play with the toys and have a good time? No, sir, friend. Those are warriors. Those are... <laughs> those are full-fledged demons in a making, friend. I'm a father. I've got three. And I've never had to teach my kids how to be rotten. It came natural. In a godly home, it came natural. How many know what I'm talking about? The Bible comes true. Society will tell you, no, you're all born angels, and you get around the wrong environment, you turn rotten. No, friend, you're rotten. I'm trying to lift you up tonight. You're rotten. We're all born nasty. We're born into bondage, born into slavery. You want to know what slavery is? A slave is one who is bound in servitude. He's completely under the domination of a spiritual, of a specified influence. That is a slave. There were slaves in the time of Christ. Children of slave women became slaves. Prisoners of war once sold into slavery. They were sold into slavery. Victims of piracy, if unable to pay ransoms, became slaves. Children were often sold by parents or guardians as slaves. Persons convicted of serious crimes became slaves. As a, as a person that's born into this world, you are born into slavery, friend. And you want to know what that slavery is? Who's your taskmaster? Sin and Lucifer, Satan. And anybody in this place has got any type of head knowledge at all about the things of God and the things of the underworld, the things of darkness, you know good and well. S satanic influence in your life is what drove you down. Some of you that were alcoholics for years, it just kept pushing you further and further and further and further. And you said, I can quit anytime I want. One lady came here and said she quit 12 times. Well, if she could quit anytime she wanted, how come the first time didn't work? How come the second time didn't work? How come the third? Want to know why? She's a slave. She's a slave. You are born into sin. You're born into that slavery. How many understand what I'm talking about? The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I also want to thank God right now, tonight, that I was not born back in the Old Testament times. Because this room would be empty tonight if every one of us were born during the Old Testament times. Because back in those days when you were rebellious, they would kill you. How many of you would be dead? Back in those days, a rebellious child was stoned for his consistent rebellion. 
constantly spitting. I watch teenagers, and teenagers look this way. There's a lot of you here tonight. Respect your mother and your father. Who do you think you are to stick your snotty nose and open this mouth and wag that tongue and say something like, you never do anything for me. Sir, next time your daughter does that, ma'am, grab her by the arm, march her into her bedroom, open up her closet, and say, my, look at all those things I never did for you. All those outfits that I never did for you. You better respect your parents. Love your parents. Don't forget that that mama that you're cussing at, that mama that you hate, at one time, she was up all night long nursing you. My wife is at home tonight. You want to know why? My little daughter's got a rash. We don't know what it's from, but she's got a rash all over her body. My daughter's two years old. And when I left the house, my, my wife had that daughter cuddled just like this right next to her. She won't leave her out of her sight. She won't let her out. Why? That's her daughter, man. She's mama. I want to tell you something else. When my little Kelsey is 20 years old, she'll still be held like that. When she's 30 years old, she'll still be hugged by mama. Some of you, you forgot that mama's the one that gave you a little milk when you cried at 1 o'clock in the morning. She lifted you up to her breast and she gave you milk. She was tired. She wanted to get some rest. But no, you cried. <laughs> How any kid can do that. I mean, we're talking about a rock star in the making. For hours. Am I telling the truth, Mama? For hours. But then you plug the mouth. Loop. That was your mama, son. That was your mama. The first man, probably the first man you met in your life whipped you on the rear end. Whap! That was a doctor, remember? Whap! And who rescued you? Mama. He gave you to mama and you went. You need to thank God for your mama. Good, thank you. Now tell your mama that. But we're born into bondage. This is going to be quick. I'm trying to explain that to you, friend. You're, that what is plaguing you, what is, what is on you is called sin. Sin will destroy you. Well, I don't believe in sin. Friend, you need to start believing in it. Sin is anything Jesus wouldn't do. He came into the world to make sure everyone had a nice new house. I don't think so. He came into the world so all his disciples could ride nice, white, purebred donkeys. No, sir. He came into the world to take away the sin of the world, that junk in your life that had you in bondage. That's a bunch of malarkey. I don't believe all that stuff. Friend, go visit a graveyard for a few minutes. Walk through the graveyard and look at the fresh graves. Do our work for a while, those of you that party hardy all the time. Live the life of an evangelist or a pastor. Bury people for a while. Bury the 18-year-old kid that just had to have one more drink on graduation night. And that last one took him over the edge and he wrapped his car around a tree. And all four of his friends, with the cap and gown still in the trunk, are dead. Life's over for him. Why? And you say, well, it's just because they, they didn't have the right environment. No, friend. It's called sin. It's called sin. And Jesus came to take it away. Well, we're born into bondage. That's the first point tonight. The second point is we're destined for destruction. For the wages of sin is death. I want to show you, friends, what you get when you are born. Somebody comes up and slips a card under your cradle. When you're born, you are already born, you're born into sin. There's not only God has a plan for your life, Lucifer has a plan for your life. And for those of you that don't understand what I'm talking about, 
See, America, this United States of America, 84% of North American adults believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Listen to me. 84% of North American adults believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God or God himself. If you don't believe my statistics, call George Gallup. We talk to him personally. 80% of North American adults, 80%, believe they're going to stand before God on Judgment Day and be held accountable for their sins. See, America knows there's a God out there, and they know there's sin out there. That means only 20% are baffled with it. 80% know without a doubt that sin is rampant through the land. But when you are born, I'm going to give you an illustration. How many need an illustration to understand this tonight? Help me, help me, Brother Steve. I'm going to show you an illustration. What happens when you are born, this is what has slipped under your crib. Go to hell. Go directly to hell. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from my time my mother conceived me. From the moment you're born, friend, this is your destiny. Now, there's a time there where God watches over you, but when you get to the age of accountability, this is the plan for your life. Go straight to hell. Go straight to hell. That's where everyone here is heading. Did you know that 80% of North American adults know they're going to stand before God one day, be held accountable for their sins? Most Americans believe there's a literal hell. There's a literal hell. You're going to go to hell. I don't believe all that stuff. You better start believing. You're destined for destructions. Romans 6.23 said, For the wages of sin is death. My slavery to the taskmaster Lucifer has me in bondage. It seems hopeless. This sinful cycle that I'm in, some of you are in such a sinful cycle, you can't seem to break loose. You can't seem to shake it. For years as a drug addict friend, you can ask my mother in this room tonight, she could not believe that I went from worse to worse to worse. Tried to straighten up, couldn't straighten up. Tried to straighten up, couldn't straighten up. I could not break the cycle. How many know what I'm talking about? You can't do it on your own. It's impossible. Something has got to free you. I realize it in myself. I didn't have the resources to pay my own ransom from slavery. Since I couldn't break myself loose, I was destined for destruction. Those of you in this room that are contemplating suicide, most of that comes. Your mind is just full of Lucifer's thoughts and self-destructive thoughts. I can't break loose from this. I'll never be able to break loose from this. What's the use? Girl, let me, look at me. Every girl in this room, don't ever, ever slice your wrist because a guy broke up with you. There are more fishies out there. Trust me. Don't kill yourself over some two-week fling. Boy, I gotta say that again, man. Someone's hung up on this. Friend, I'm trying to help you, sis. I'm trying to help you. Don't fall for that junk. I love you, Susan. You're the prettiest girl in the whole school. And you go, well, what about Beth that you dated last week? Oh, she's, that was last week, Susan. You're different. Well, what about, what about Rebecca? That Susan, that was last month. That's old stuff. I love you. They're not like you. You're different. You're different. Here, I want to go steady with you. We've been knowing each other for, goodness, 15 minutes now. <laughs> Don't you love me too? Well, I da ba da ba. Sure you do, Susan. And he bats his eyes. You bat yours. He writes you a note, says, I love you, X, 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 and you melt like putty. You've known the guy for 30 minutes. Now you're wearing his varsity jacket. You go tell all your friends. You walk down the hallway with him. He slips his arm through yours, and you're just walking down the hallway together. You're in heaven. It's funny, friend. Five days later, you're in the back seat of a car with him after a football game. He wants something out of you. Want to know why? 
because he already got you into the football game. He spent, dear Lord, six bucks. He took you out to pizza. That put him back $15. He's already spent $21 on you. He wants something out of you, girl. And besides, you've known him for two weeks. If you really loved him, you'd go all the way. The reason there's not a whole lot of laughter going on, this is happening tonight all over America. Right now, on the beaches of Pensacola, there's girls losing their virginity. Right now, over some. They came down with their family. They came down with their family. She's 17, and she says, Mama, let me just walk the beach by myself. So they slip out of the condo. Mom and Dad said, be back by 10. And she's out there walking up and down the beach, and some hunk walks up and just sweeps her off her feet. He says, boy, I've never met a girl like you. And within three days, this virgin girl is going to be swept off her feet by some con artist. Don't fall for it, friend. It's called sin. It's called sin. And guy, let me tell you something. It's not all, I know it's not all the guy's fault. I know that. But guy, if you really loved her, you would keep your grubby paws off of her. You wouldn't manhandle her. You would respect her if you loved her. You would wait until marriage if you loved her. And any man that cannot do that, any young man that cannot do that, you've got to have your hands all over her. You're not in love, you're in lust. That's not love. If you respected her and you loved her, you wouldn't touch her. You would grow spiritually with her. You would go to church together. You would do things. You'd take walks in the, in the, in the park together and talk and get to know one another. You don't learn about one another in the back seat of a car. That's animals. That's animal. Hmm. Well, how can you tell if you're a slave to sin? Ask yourself this question. Is there a driving force in my life that causes me to do evil? Is there a driving force in me Go to hell. Go directly to hell. Ain't nobody dragging me to hell. Are you sure? Can you feel that? I'm all right until I walk by a pornographic movie. I do okay until I walk into the blockbuster video and I see the X-rated movies. I was all right until I walked in there and I, I, just, was, I was just going to rent a, a G or, or a PG movie and stay away from most PGs, folks. You're doing all right. But then you saw the big poster and the seductive woman. And you're a married man. You don't need that trash. And you see it. And you say, I can control myself. Then how come you're walking towards it? I can see the line pulling you in, man. Sucking you in. And you get close to that when you grab it and you look to the right and there's another one. Go, man, I haven't seen that. How about a triple feature tonight? You buy, you take all three of them, you rent them, you're out the door. But you have perfect control, don't you, Bubba? You ain't got no control. You're a slave. You are a slave. You want to, a man, a true man can turn his head, walk away. Someone that says they got control, you know, and they're just led around. They're just led around by sin. They're wimps. Anybody can do that. Anybody can stick a needle in their arm. Anybody can stick a joint in their mouth. Anybody can sit around a bar stool and drink beer all night long. Anybody can be a sot. Anybody can be an alcoholic. It takes a man to stand up and make a living. It takes a man to stand up and pay the bills in the house. It takes a man to stand up and love his children. It takes a godly man to grow up and spend time with his children and love his family and respect his wife. Those of you that have been married two years, God bless you. Get married for, and let me see you in 10 years and 15 years. I've been married 18 years and I love it. I love my wife. And I get around people that have been married 50 years and I see how happy they are. And I go, I know I'm going to be just like that. I love my wife. 
I love my family. We go out on a date. Every week, my wife and I spend six to seven hours together, just Jerry and me, out on a date. Never miss it. You can ask my staff. We never miss it. Hours and hours together. We make time. Why? We love each other. We love each other. Friend, is there something controlling you? Go directly to hell. Pulling you all the way there. This is making sense to me. I don't know if it is to you. Have you tried to break away and you always end up back? Have you, I'm talking about, friend, how you can tell whether you're a slave. You're destined for destruction. Have you ever experienced a release from this way of life by an outside force? Have you ever gotten away from that? Have you ever been delivered from that? We talk to these little children up here that, are, that masturbate all. They, they masturbate every week, almost every day, some of these kids. And now they started when they were just little children. And now they're 17 and 18 years old. And they're consumed with lust. I want to tell you the chain. Everyone listen to this. Those of you at home, sir, you are so caught up in this, you better not turn that channel. But lust is just like drugs. Just a little bit at first, and I'm speaking from experience. And after a while, a joint of marijuana don't satisfy like it used to. And your friends are hanging around, they're popping pills, so you pop the pills too. Lust, the playboy doesn't satisfy anymore. I need hustler. I need some raunch. Then you read that for a little while. You look at the pictures for a while. Then you got to go a little bit deeper. And maybe you check out the Holiday Inn, you go to a lingerie show. Check out the lingerie. Watch the women parade across the, the runway. That doesn't satisfy you either anymore. Why? Because you're getting deep. You're just like somebody that's about to get a needle for the first time in a drugstore, and instead of popping the pill, they're going to melt it down in a spoon, and they're going to run it up. That's where you're at now because you want to fix. You want to fix. You've got to be satisfied. And now you're deeper into it. Now, you're doing something you said you would never do. You're going to those sleazy, slimy porno shops on the other side of town. You park your car around back because you're embarrassed. You've even gone as far, sir, as parking your car down by the mall and you had a taxi take you down there and say, pick me up at 9 o'clock because you are so embarrassed of what you're doing. But you're an addict now, friend. Go to hell. Go directly to hell. I can see that line as clearly as I can see you tonight. You're being pulled in there. I can stop it any time I want. Then why don't you? I can break loose of this lust any time I want. Some of you walked in this church and as girls were dancing, you were undressing them with your eyes. Ma'am, you were doing the same thing. Looking at men, eyeballing men, doing this, doing that. You say you got perfect control. Ha! Huh. When are you going to learn to turn your head? When are you going to learn to plead the blood? We're going to say, Jesus, I'm so sick of this. I'm so sick of being a slave. You said that when the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. I'm so tired of being drug around. I'm so tired of alcohol and drugs driving me. I'm so tired of having to hang around my friends that are always pulling me down. Why do I have to always have these friends around me? That's another thing that really bugs the daylights out of me these days. Young people, look at me. I love you tonight, man. By the way, this little thing right here is for Niceville High School. Y'all wave at me from Niceville. Love you guys. I love you. I love you. I love you. There's a great controversy going on over at Niceville right now because some of the teachers have been preaching the cross. Yeah. Glory! Lord, have mercy on us. They're accused of praying for kids. Not that. Give them a condom. Don't pray for them. Give her an abortion. Dear God, where have we gone, America? When you can give a kid a condom under the table and say, it's okay, sexual activity is okay, you're 15 now. 
And then when the condom doesn't work and they come up pregnant, you can take them to the abortion doctors and don't have to tell their parents. But don't you dare pray for them. Don't you dare read the Bible to them. Father, forgive us. This nation that was founded under God. In God we trust. We have on our money. Forgive us for lying. But some of you are in such bondage to your friends. You're a follower. Your friends go that way, you go that way. Your friends go this way, you go that way. And you say, I can break away from them anytime I want to. If they're pulling you down, then why don't you? Why don't you? Or is it one again? Is that another link on that chain? The devil's got a hold of you and saying this, you got to have your friends, man. Everybody's got friends. If you don't hang around your friends, you're going to be all by yourself. People are going to laugh at you. People are going to think that you got some type of disease, a social disease, if you don't have your gang with you. Friend, when I gave my heart to the Lord, my friends left me. I'm talking every one of them. And I had hundreds. My mama will testify to you for that. I had hundreds. They paraded through my house like, like water. After I got saved, man, they didn't want nothing to do with me no more. And that's my third point tonight, and Charity's going to come sing. We're born into bondage. We're destined for destruction. But hallelujah, we are delivered from damnation. We are delivered. Friend, it happened. It happened 2,000 years ago. For me, on October 28, 1975, something came falling from the sky, friend. As I began to say the name Jesus, this card was dropped in my lap, and it said this, Get out of hell free! Get out of hell free! Get out of hell free! Woo! Get out of hell free! Go to jail! Get out of hell! Hallelujah! Woo! For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Woo! Lamb of God! Ho! Oh. Yes! 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 Friends, yeah, hey! Some of you in this room, I'm going to tell you something straight up. You better get an education. Some of you going, all oh, this devil stuff and this Jesus stuff. Friend, why don't you go talk to some of those groups out there? If you don't believe in all this, why don't you go to, to New Orleans and visit the covens? Go to England and visit the fresh graves of those who have been sacrificed. Visit with me to Argentina and get around the Macumba religion where I lived for seven years where they sacrifice children. I don't believe in the devil. Friend, you better wake up. What do you think is causing another man to slice his body open? What do you think is causing a man to rip a kid's arm off? What do you think is causing a man to offer a baby to Lucifer? You think that's a non-belief? No, friend. You better get an education. He's rampant, and it's not just in some far regions of the world. He's been playing games with America for years. Well, I'm going to close in just a second, but I'll never forget when I got saved, I got saved because I was lost. I was going to hell, friend. And Jesus came into my life. I'm not talking religion tonight. I'm talking to Christianity. Religion's hanging around the cross. Christianity's getting on the cross. Religion won't save you. Jesus will save you. But I'll never forget, when I got saved, 
I went through a program called Teen Challenge. Teen Challenge is an awesome program. And I was up in Missouri, and we get in this big old bus, and we had a bus driver named Santos Nunez. He was a gang member that got saved, and on this bus were the worst people in the world. I mean, we were all, there was about, the bus held 40 people. There was about 75 of us on the bus. And we'd all start that bus rocking because we were all just sort of, you know, ex-dopers, you know, and crazy anyhow. And we'd get that bus rocking back and forth. Old school bus, okay? And it would lift off the wheels. We'd go back and forth like that. And Santos would just be flying down the highway. <laughs> and this is up in Missouri. You know those Missouri mountains? We'd go up and down, up and down. And, and we'd start going up the hills. We'd go, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. We'd get up to the top and, whoa, down we'd go. And we'd start singing. Now, this is a bunch of ex-partiers. I'm talking about druggies. I'm talking about narcotics users, bad street people. We'd be singing songs like this. I've been redeemed, I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed, I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, filled with the Holy Ghost I am. All my sins are washed away. I've been redeemed. And I'd look around. I'd look around at all these druggies, man. Now, these guys were killers. And then, then, then one of them, and it'd be some, some junkie from New York, you know, he'd, he'd go, he goes, well, you can't get to heaven. We'd go, well, you can't get to him on roller skates, on roller skates. And we'd go, well, you can't get to heaven. Well, you can't get to heaven. Everybody would be singing this song. On roller skates. Well, you can't get to heaven on roller skates. You roll right past those pearly gates. All my sins are washed away. I've been redeemed. I mean, friend, it was so stupid. But we were so happy. Then another guy would go, well, you can't get to heaven. They're making these things up. You can't get to heaven. No, you can't get to heaven. In a putt-putt car. In a putt-putt car. These are, you got to understand, these are like ex, you know, bikers from New Orleans, you know. Raunchy guys, you know. Putt-putt car. Well, you can't get to heaven on a putt-putt car. A putt-putt car won't go that far. Uh, but every one of them had this card sticking out of their top pocket. They were free and free indeed. They were free, free indeed. Get out of hell free. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. Well, Charity, get up here. I'm going to read a scripture. 1 Peter 1, 18. I've already given you a bunch of scriptures, but knowing that you are not redeemed, you are not bought out of slavery with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished, and spotless the blood of Christ for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for sincere love of the brethren fervently love one another from the heart friend for you have been born again not of the seed which is perishable remember we were born friend into sin, but this is a different born again. But imperishable, that is, through the living and abiding Word of God. Friend, He'll change everything. He will change everything. You want to know why America is coming to this revival? I want to tell you why. Every gamut, we've had billionaires come to this revival, millionaires and street people. All across, I mean, teachers, doctors, lawyers, congressmen, Governors' families have come to this revival and street people, kids, students. We've had sick people. We've had well people. We've had baby boomers by the thousands, generation Xers by the tens of thousands. Why? They know this is the truth. They know this is the truth. 
Everyone stand. Woo! Get out of hell free. Let me tell you, friend. Move the chairs, those of you moving to the left and the right. If you're thinking about sneaking out, I want to tell you right now, friend, if you're going to go to the bathroom, we got speakers in the bathroom. <laughs> speakers in the hallway, speakers in the bathroom. I'm thinking about putting them outside. We had a girl run out of this place. She was so mad at me. She hated me, man. Not everybody's our friend, by the way, because we talk about sin and getting it out. She hated me. She was sitting right over here. She got up right in the middle of the message, jumped into her car, flew home, mad as a hornet. Saturday night, she went into her house, grabbed the remote, turned on the TV. I was preaching just like that. It was last Saturday night's message, a message from the Saturday night previous, talking about the same thing in her life. The next Sunday, that next day, she came to the church. She said, I give up. I give. God loves you, friend. He loves you. You need to thank God. He's after you. The most, the most horrible, for those of you that were here last night, when I preached on the sermon from the last summit, what it was like during the days of Noah, and the last man alive, what he would say to everyone in this congregation, if he was here tonight, what he would say is the flood waters, waters were rising above the last mountain. He was the last man on earth. He was at the top of the last tree, hanging on for dear life. What he would tell this congregation. One of the things he would say to us is, God's spirit will not always contend with you. That means God's spirit will not always be with you. Tonight, friend, don't take it for granted. Some of you have laughed tonight. Some of you have cried. Some of you have laughed and cried. But tonight, friend, it's time, it's time for you to make a decision. It's time for you to decide. Choose you this day who you're going to serve. The Lord spoke to me earlier that some of you are so consumed with sin. So consumed. It's got a hold of you. You're just being pulled down. You say to me, man, this is hell on earth for me. You ain't seen hell. If you could put your foot close to the flames of hell, you would quit sinning like that and live like an angel the rest of your life. If you could just be hung over hell for 20 seconds, you would never sin again. But it's a real place. Jesus offered you a way out. Those of you moving the chairs, I want you to line up on the sides and up in the stairwells and just wait right now. I don't want anyone talking, no one distracting anyone else. If someone's talking to you about where you're going to go eat after the service, tell them to please be quiet right now. You want to listen. I'm going to give this altar call for those of you that are backslidden. That means you've known the Lord at one time in your life but you're doing things that Jesus would never do. You hear me? You're doing things that Jesus would never do. That's what sin is. I get constant calls from the people in the media, and they ask me about this very question. What is sin? I got a call from the British Broadcasting Network in England the other day, and they asked me, they said, someone told me to call you. We're doing a three-day series on the devil. They said, you believe in him. Boy, she got a program, man. But a lot of these folks will call and they say, talk to me about sin. What are you talking about when you talk about sin? Sin is anything Jesus wouldn't do. Would Jesus, the most righteous man who's ever lived on the face of this earth, would he be sitting in your living room on that couch watching that program with you? When that woman begins taking her clothes off, would he sit there and watch it with you. I don't think so, sir. I don't think so, ma'am. Would Jesus sit there and listen to GD this and GD that and his name being used in vain all through the program? I don't think so. I think it'd be an abomination to him. I think he'd turn to you and say, 
Don't you call yourself Christian? Is this not contrary to Christian? My child, if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. You cannot have God and mammon. No man can serve two masters. It grieves the Lord to see shackles around you, friend. And some of you are shackled. I'm going to give you the opportunity tonight to get the junk out. Get the junk out. All the great awakenings that has ever taken place in America, what you're seeing here tonight is basically what they saw in America in the 1700s, mid-1700s, late 1700s. In Boston, when George Whitfield would preach, Boston had 23,000 people at that time. Every one of them came to his meeting. They say 23,000 came to George Whitfield's meeting. Why? To hear the same thing you're hearing tonight. Isn't that amazing? The same thing. People would cry and squall. I'm talking about the history of America. The foundation of our school system. I wish somehow I could, could resurrect Noah Webster from the dead and bring him up here. The man who wrote the most popular dictionary in our culture. He would stand up before you and he would say, listen to the preacher. The old Webster dictionaries are full of scripture from the beginning to the end. Almost every word that has anything to do with action, he'll show you a scripture there to back it up from the Bible. You take an abridged dictionary today, 1997 edition, you won't find a scripture in there. But the original Webster dictionaries that are thick, as thick as they are today, are loaded. That's why they were so thick. They were so loaded with scripture. Sin, in the original Webster dictionary, is this long in fine print. And then he starts talking about sinners. All the scriptures in the Bible. Look it up today. It's about this big. Nothing to it. Webster would roll over in his grave. He would scream at Miriam Webster company and say, take my name off that book. Friend, sin is anything Jesus wouldn't do. If you're backslidden in this place, you're doing things that Jesus wouldn't do. You're backslidden in this place, you're no longer convicted over the sins in your life, but God tonight's gotten a hold of you. Thank your precious name, Jesus. Bless you. And we'll give this altar call. You're going to come quickly and get that junk out of your life. Those of you that have never known the Lord in this place, he's here. He's here. Let me ask you something. If you were in a, in a serious, serious con car accident this evening. These aren't scare taxes. This is life. This is going to happen all over America tonight. Last night, a woman who was delivered from witchcraft was here. She's awesome. She's a paramedic. She came to this revival with a gun. With intentions to hurt us. She gave her heart to Jesus. Powerfully, powerfully saved. Awesome. Raised. She was raised in witchcraft. Her family is a coven of witches. She's raised in witchcraft. She came here to do us bodily harm. She got saved, and she was here now. This happened months ago. She, got, she was here last night. I looked into her eyes. I mean, we're talking a changed person. And I said, what do you do for a living? Her name's Dawn. And I, she said, I'm a paramedic. You know, I bet it's different now for Dawn when she goes to a car accident. And someone's lying there, and Dawn knows they're at the end. That Dawn is watching the last few breaths out of that man's mouth. He'll never make it to the hospital. She knows it. I can guarantee you that man lying on that stretcher is not thinking about bank accounts. He's not thinking about how nice his car is or what condition his car is in. He's not thinking about buying a new home and he could care less about where he's going to vacation this summer. He's almost dying. He's, almost, he's going to die. You know what he's thinking about? Where am I going? A friend of mine was shot by a witch up in Huntsville, Alabama. His name's Jerry Simon. As he walked into his church, a witch walked up and shot her. It was one of the biggest crimes in that area. Many of you know about it. He's a dear friend of mine. Shot him. And as he was dying, blood was coming down the door. He, he grabbed the key of the door and he turned it so the witch couldn't get inside the door and kill his wife. At Pastor Valley Fellowship, they come to this revival all the time. Jerry Simon was shot and they brought him to the hospital. 
He was laying, on the, laying in the hospital, and they were going to do surgery. And he went just like this. A big smile came across his face, and he said, hallelujah. And he died. He died. He was just ushered into the kingdom, friend. But what would you have done? In a situation like that, would you be lying on that bed? Would you be going, Jesus, forgive me. I'm a sinner. Or would you go, Jesus, into your hands, I commit my spirit. What would you do? I'm not talking. I'm not talking religion tonight, friend. Religion will damn your soul. I'm not talking about Jerry Simon didn't look up to heaven and go, in the name of Valley Fellowship Church. Jerry Simon knew his Savior. You can be a part of a church, friend. You can sing in the choir and go to hell. With bat you can go to hell with a choir robe on. You can go to hell with a communion cup in your hand and a wafer in your mouth. You can go to hell with a certificate of ordination hanging behind your desk from your local denomination, from any denomination. You can be the head deacon of First Baptist Pensacola or the, an usher at Brownsville Assembly and go to hell if you don't know Jesus. So those of you in this room that have never known the Lord, those of you that are backslidden, I'm going to give you the opportunity right now to get your heart right with God, and you're going to come quickly tonight, friend. We're not playing games. When charity begins to sing, if there's sin in your life, I want you to come quickly and get on your face before the Lord. And if any of you in this room that are religious but you don't know Jesus, you need to be down here too. Religion will not save you. Church attendance will not save you. Tithing will not save you. Only the blood will save you. I guarantee you Sunday morning the devil works overtime getting people to church. I want you to hear me, pastors. He wakes up people every Sunday morning and says, go, 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 scoop, 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 scoop. Time to go to church, time to go to church. Set your roast. Set the roast. You think that's the Lord? No, friend. The devil works overtime on Sunday morning because he knows if he can get America in their religious institutions, they will feel good about themselves so they can sin the rest of the week. He watches them. They've testified from the baptismal pool. One man said, I would go to church on Sunday morning, get out of church, get my boat, get a couple six-packs of beer, and go get stinking drunk out on the water. Religion in America... Some of them don't even make it out the door. They get into the parking lot and they're already cursing their wives. But just a few minutes ago, they were going, oh, Amazing. Isn't this a wonderful service, honey? Religion will damn you, friend. Do you know him? Do you know Jesus? Do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your lips? Do you go to sleep at night with Jesus on your lips? Do you eat, drink, and breathe Jesus? Is he everything to you? If he's not, I question your salvation. You're supposed to be the bride of Christ. You're supposed to be consumed with the groom. Anybody that's not, they call themselves a Christian, I question it, friend, and Paul would stand here Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, would stand here and say, examine yourself to see if you're really in the faith. Right now, everyone who needs forgiveness, everyone who's away from God, everyone who's never known the Lord, as soon as charity begins to sing, I want you to come quickly. Right now, come on, hurry, hurry. I need Jesus. I need forgiveness right now. Hurry, come on, come on. God bless you, sis. Hurry in the balcony. Let's go. Come on, come on. Come on, hurry.
God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, sis. God bless you, son. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on in the balcony. You in home. Come on. Come on. What are you waiting on? Don't sit there, friend. Get up on your feet and ask the Lord to forgive you. Get down. Get on your knees. Say, Jesus, wash me. Cleanse me. Make me new. I was born into bondage. I was destined for destruction. But right now, I am going to live for eternity with you, Jesus, because you paid the price. You bought me out of slavery. Right now, say, Jesus, forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me. He'll do it, friend. Come on. Come on. Hurry. Hurry. Stay where you're at, at the altar. Shh. We're waiting on you, friend. God's tugging at your heart. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. God bless you. Come on down, sis. Come on. Come on. Hurry. People are still coming. Be patient. Come on. God bless you, sis. God bless you, sis. Come on. Come on. God bless you, son. Don't anyone move at this altar. Stay right where you're at. Come on. Come on. Come on. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, sis. People are praying for you, sir. People are weeping for you, sir. Come on. Come on down. Come on down. Come on down. Lindell, could you just play this one time through, brother, and then we're going to close. You've got about 60 seconds, friends. We're going to close the altar. Come on. For sin we repent, oh Lord. We believe your holy word. Come on. Have mercy now, we pray. He paid the price. He 
paid the price. Everyone at the altar, bow your heads. No one looking around at this altar. Everyone bow your heads. We're going to ask the Lord right now to forgive us, to wash us clean. And if you're serious about this prayer, friend, he will do it for you. He will do it for you. Pray with me right now out loud. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. No, friend, that was a mumble. Pray out loud. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. Thank, you thank you for speaking to me. Speaking to you. Thank, you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, for not leaving me alone. Thank you, Jesus, Thank you, Jesus. For, your for your presence in this place. In this place. I, know, Jesus, I know, Jesus, that I was born into bondage. I born into bondage. And, I know, Jesus, and I know, Jesus, that I was destined, I was destined. For, destruction. for destruction. But I also know tonight, also know tonight. that by your, blood, by your blood, I have been, I have been. Delivered, delivered from damnation. I ask you tonight to wash my sins away. Cleanse me. Make me new. The things that I've done that have hurt you and hurt others. Forgive me, Jesus. Make me new. I ask you tonight to be my Savior, my Lord, and my very best friend. I commit myself to you from this moment on. I am yours, and you are mine, in Jesus' name. In Jesus